What is it that you hope for? As you think about this year, or even as you think about today, what are the things that you hope for? Perhaps they're big things, perhaps they're small things. Perhaps they're things like you hope that you or your family will have a healthy and comfortable life. Perhaps it's those small things that might feel big right at the moment. You're hoping that the food will be ready when people come over today. Or you're hoping that there won't be any disagreements as family gather together. Perhaps you've got bigger hopes, but they're kind of really close to your heart hopes. Hopes that, well, you won't be lonely this Christmas. Or that the grief and sorrow won't overwhelm you as you gather, as you reflect on people who are not here. Perhaps you've got hopes of, you know, just that it's going to be a good surf day tomorrow. There might be all sorts of hopes we have. But as you think about those hopes, do they last? I take it most, if not all, the hopes that we have, they're there, but they won't last. And perhaps, perhaps we take that idea of hope that is this positive kind of optimistic view, but we don't have certainty. Perhaps we take that definition of hope and we bring it into what the Bible talks about hope. And we think, well, hope is something that the Bible talks about that's just kind of wishful thinking. That Christmas is just this wishful thinking idea. And what I want us to see today is that as we come to God's Word, the hope that God's word opens to us is not just wishful thinking, it's not just optimistic view, it's a certainty. And it's all grounded in who Jesus is. And so that's why we're going to look at the birth account of Jesus. And we're going to look at it from two different perspectives. Firstly, from Joseph's and then from God. And so let's first of all think about from Joseph's perspective, because you see, Joseph is he's faced with a dilemma of an unplanned pregnancy. Have a look with me, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. So we're introduced to Mary, mother of Jesus, and she's pledged or engaged to be married to Joseph. But the dilemma for Joseph is that he finds out before they've come together, that's another way of saying before they've had sexual intercourse, She's pregnant. And can you imagine what that's like for Joseph? He's engaged to a woman. Now, in the Jewish culture, there was two parts to marriage. You will get engaged, and legally, you were already married. But then about a year later, the wife would then go home with the husband, and then they would consummate the marriage. And so in this engagement period, they haven't slept together, and yet she's pregnant. Can you imagine what will be going through Joseph's mind? Perhaps frustration, anger, disappointment, shame, confusion. This was the woman he was going to marry. He's already legally married to her, and then he finds out she's pregnant, and it's not his kid. And she's saying it's from the Holy Spirit. And he's like, come on, man, who says that? No one's ever had a baby from the Holy Spirit. But what does Joseph decide to do in light of this dilemma? Look at verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph's solution to this dilemma is, well, I'll divorce her, but I'll do it quietly. Because remember, they are legally married, even though she hasn't come home with him yet. But he doesn't want to disgrace her publicly. Did you notice that? He could have gone, she has a baby that's not mine. I'm going to make a big deal. And so the whole community knows. But he chooses not to. He wants to do it quietly. And quietly in the first century would be, you just needed two witnesses. So that he would divorce her. Joseph's solution to this dilemma that he's experienced is a quiet divorce. And can you imagine how that would be... For poor Mary, she didn't ask for this. She hasn't been unfaithful. She's actually been faithful so much so that God would say to her, I'm going to conceive in you, my son, by the Holy Spirit. But Joseph's not buying it. And so he wants to divorce her quietly. 
But while Joseph has made up his mind, what we see is that God is not finished yet. He's got a plan and he needs to unveil that to Joseph. And so have a look with me as God intervenes. And we see this in verse 20. Have a look at verse 20. But after he had considered this, that's Joseph, of getting divorced, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. You see, God intervenes and he says, Joseph, this is part of my plan. Mary's not lying to you. It's true. She is pregnant. But God has been at work, powerfully at work, by his Holy Spirit. She has been faithful to you. She hasn't been sleeping around. And so, Joseph, marry her. Did you see? Take her home to be your wife. That's the second part of the Jewish marriage. Take her home. Remain married to her. And, but it's not just that. Not only does God call Joseph to marry Mary, look what else he says in verse 21. She'll give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. God also says to Mary, this child that's not yours, I want you to name him. And that's a big deal in Jewish culture. You can read about it, and I've got the reference there in Isaiah 43. But the, cult- the context is, if a father names a child that's not his, he's actually welcome this, welcoming this child into his family. He's formally adopting this child into his family. God is asking Joseph to not only welcome Mary into his family, but this child that's not his, into his family too. And the question is, What will Joseph do? Will he trust God's word? And there's consequences to that. People will look at him and go, what are you doing, man? You're marrying a a woman that has had a baby that's not yours. Or would he rather uphold his status in in the culture and the community around him? Trust God's word or look good to the community? What would you do? Well, let's see what Joseph does. We see it in verse 24. You see, Joseph trusts God's word. Look at verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. Joseph obeys God. He takes her home. He does that second part of the marriage. He takes her home. He welcomes her. Instead of shaming her, he welcomes her. He welcomes her into his family. But did you notice he even goes above and beyond what God said? Because in verse 25, he doesn't consummate the marriage. He wants to make it very clear. This child is not physically or biologically his. God has been at work. And so... He welcomes Mary into his family. And that's an important deal. Because if you look in verse 20, we're told a little bit of Joseph's family. He's the son of David, King David. A thousand years earlier, King David was the pinnacle king of Israel's history, the greatest king of Israel's past. And Joseph is from King David's family line. And so when Joseph marries Mary and says, you are part of my family now, he is welcoming Mary into the family line of King David, a royal family line. And so just like William welcomed Kate into his royal family, Joseph welcomes Mary into his royal family line. But it's not just Mary. See, there was two commands that Joseph had to obey. He marries Mary, but also look at the end of verse 25. And he gave him, the baby, the name Jesus. It's a big deal. We just go, oh, he named the child Jesus. No, this is Joseph saying, this child who's not mine, I'm going to formally adopt him into my family. And by doing so, he brings Jesus into the family line of King David. It's an amazing thing. Welcoming Jesus into the family line of King David. But why is that important? Why does that matter that Jesus, who was conceived by a virgin, is now welcomed in to the family line of King David? 
That's what I want us to finish us thinking about. It matters because it reveals Jesus' identity. And that's what God has in plan, to reveal Jesus' identity, because Jesus' identity brings hope. I don't know if you uh, know, but in Jewish culture and throughout their history, names matter. Names either said something about what they represented in the current situation, either for the person or for the nation, or it represented something that would happen in the future for the person or for the nation. Now, for some of us, names matter. For others of us, names don't matter. For uh, Chinese culture, names do matter. And so when my grandparents named me, uh, they gave me the Chinese name Sai Ho. Uh, Sai meaning global, Ho meaning prosperous. You can see what my grandparents thought. They wanted me to be globally prosperous. I became a pastor. But, you know, (laughs) but names matter. And the names that we see here in our passage, I wonder if you saw three names given to Jesus, three titles given to Jesus. And that's what I want us to think about. First title that he's given is that he's given the title Messiah. Look at verse 18. This is the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. The word Messiah is the Hebrew word. That's what the Old Testament was written in. And the Greek word is Christ. And what does that word mean, Christ and Messiah? It means anointed one. Kings were the anointed ones. King David was the anointed one. King David was the anointed one that God promised, and you can check it out later in 2 Samuel 7, that God promised to King David that you are the anointed one, and there will be a a child that comes from your family line who will be king forever. That was a thousand years earlier. Than when Jesus was born. And now Matthew writes for us, God tells us Jesus is that Messiah, the anointed one, the king who will come from the line of David. That's why Joseph needed to name Jesus. Because by doing so, he welcomes Jesus into the family line, adopts Jesus into the King David's family line, so that Jesus can fulfill what was promised a thousand years earlier that there will be an anointed one, a Messiah who will come, who will be king forever. But what type of king will this king be? This forever king, this king with ultimate authority and power. Well, we see it in the second name, the second title that Jesus is given, his name, Jesus. Have a look with me, verse 21. Uh, that's, this is what Joseph is to do. You are to name him Jesus. Now, Jesus is the Greek name. But the Hebrew name for Jesus is Joshua. And Joshua means the Lord saves. So you've got this idea already that this Jesus, this child is the Messiah, the anointed one, the king who will rule forever. And now we're told he's going to save. But he's not going to save like the previous kings of Israel's past who saved through political and military power. Because we're given a more detailed way of how he's going to save. Have a look again at the end of verse 21. Because he will save his people from their sins. It's not from the Romans or any other political power. Jesus comes to save his people from their sins. Sin is a way of just describing how we treat God. A way where we say to God, I'm not interested in you. I want to do things my way. And God says, if we treat God that way, We are deserving of his just and right judgment that lasts forever. Now, you might be sitting here and thinking, yeah, but John, I'm not that bad. Like, I'm comparing to the people around me. No offense to those around me, but I'm not as bad as them. Or you might be thinking, but I'm a pretty good person. Why do I need saving? Why would God think of me as a sinner who needs to be saved? But no matter where we are on the spectrum, and perhaps some of you are sitting here and you know deeply that you are far from God. And you're thinking, how would he ever want me? And wherever we are on that spectrum, whether we think we're good enough or we're not good enough, we all would agree, myself included, we're not perfect. And that's the problem. You see, God is the perfect God. And how can us, who are not perfect, be anywhere near him? And how can us who are not perfect, be in His perfect new creation forever. We can't. Perfect and imperfect can't be together. We are at odds with God, and that's why we need a Savior. 
And that's why Jesus comes, to save us, because we can't save ourselves. The anointed one, the Messiah, the King, who has all power and authority, He comes to save us, because we can't save ourselves. But if Jesus is just human like us, then how can He save us? Well, that gets us to the final title that is given to Jesus in verse 23, Emmanuel. Have a look with me, verse 23, 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, Matthew helps us remember not only something that happened a thousand years ago, promised to King David in 2 Samuel 7, he also then reminds us of what God promised 700 BC through the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 7, God promised that there will be one who will come, who will be born of a virgin, and that you will call him Emmanuel, because God will be with us. Jesus is born to a virgin. Jesus is the fulfillment of something that was promised 700 years earlier. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. That's quite striking, isn't it? That Jesus, the eternal Son, gives up being in heaven with His Father to become one of us. And He becomes one of us in the most humbling ways, a baby, where He's going to have to be fed and wiped up, and put to sleep, and burped, and all those things. It's the ultimate expression of undercover boss, isn't it? You know, we see CEOs hang out with factory workers. This is the Creator God becoming one of us. And He does it not to check up on us, but remember, He comes to save us. But how is it that He comes to save us Well, it's because of who He is. He is God with us. He is both fully man and fully God, and that matters. Because as fully man, He lives the life we can't live. He lives that perfect life. See, Jesus doesn't just come and bam, He's 33 years old and then dies on the cross. No, He lives 33 years. He knows what it's like, and yet He lives that perfect life we can't live. He lives in total obedience to God. And then... When he dies that very first Easter, on that cross, he's not dying for himself. He's perfect. He dies for us. He takes on God's just judgment for us. But as the one who is both fully man but also fully God, he's the only one who can endure God's just judgment and come out of it alive. No one else can do that. That's what makes Easter Sunday so great, because there is one man who is both fully man and fully God, who comes back to life again to show us that death, sin, has been dealt with because he's the anointed king who comes to save, and he does it because it is God with us to save you and me. That's what makes Christmas full of hope, a certain hope, not on what we hope for, but on what Jesus has done for us because of who He is, the King, the Messiah, the one who comes to save us from our sins, who is both man and God with us. And so this Christmas, 2023, How will you respond to this good news? Because there is certain hope offered to each one of you. Perhaps you're sitting here and you're going, I hadn't heard about this before. I want to investigate more. Awesome. We love that you're here. Uh, There's many ways that you can investigate this more. I really want to encourage you to do that. And I've got three ways that you could start investigating for yourself. Firstly, come back. Come back here, as I said uh, earlier, and you've heard it from Scott here at St. David's, we are on about hearing God from His Word and who He is from it. And so come back, every every Sunday we're here. Next week, 
Christmas, uh, not Christmas, New Year's Eve, 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 5.15 p.m. We'd love for you to come, and next year we'll be here every Sunday as well. Come and hear more about who this God is. But secondly, I'd encourage you, read about who Jesus is for yourself. Perhaps you haven't done this for a while. Perhaps you did it when you were a kid, but you haven't done it as an adult. Read one of the four biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, come find me. I'd love to give you one, or you can grab one out the back. We've got these essential Jesus. Basically, it's Luke's gospel. Read about who Jesus is for yourself. Investigate. You know, you've got time over this Christmas break. Investigate for Jesus for yourself. But then thirdly, I want to encourage you, consider coming along to Christianity Explored. Come and hear and investigate for yourself, but with others. It starts in February. We're giving you a bit of time over the new year. Get the year ready, and then come investigate for yourself with others. Any question you can ask. You can listen to other people ask questions. And I'd say, just come for the first night. If you're like, ah, oh, I'm not sure if I want to come along, just come for the first night and see what it's like. See if it's an opportunity for you to investigate who this Jesus is, because here's the thing. If you work out who Jesus is, then you will find out a hope that is certain, that's not grounded in who you are and what you do, but in who Jesus is and what He's done for you. And that's a certain hope because it's not grounded in you, but in Him. So can I really encourage you, consider investigating Jesus for yourself. But I want to take this moment also to kind of get right into your personal bubble. And perhaps you're sitting here and you're thinking, but I, I want to trust in God personally now. And if that's you, that's awesome. And we'd love to help you work that out. And the way to do that is to talk to God. And we talk to God in prayer. And to say to God, God, I need your son, Jesus. Perhaps you've been sitting here, maybe for the first time, maybe you've been in church for a long time, but you're going, actually, today I want to trust in God personally, myself, and trust in this Jesus, who is the Messiah, who is the King, who has come to save me, who is God with us. And so you can pray this prayer that I've got up on the screen, but also you can find it in the handout there. And the prayer is this. It's talking to God and saying, thank you, God, that Jesus came to save me for my sins. That's his second name, Jesus, the one who comes to save. And it says to God, you're acknowledging in prayer to God, sorry for rejecting you in my life. That's sin. Please forgive me. And thanking Jesus, thanking God that Jesus has died for you personally. Not just for the world, but for you. So that you can be forgiven. That you can have a hope, a certain hope, that you're forgiven in God's eyes. And the last part of the prayer is asking God to help you follow Jesus as king, not just as saviour, but as king. Remember, that's his title, the Messiah, the anointed one, the king, and to live in obedience to him. And so I'm going to pray this prayer, and if you would like to pray this prayer, you can pray it in the quietness of your heart and in your mind, and the great thing is, even though I don't hear it, God does. And his answer to you will be, yes, you are forgiven. Yes, You are in right relationship with me because of Jesus. And so let me lead us in a time of prayer. And if you want to pray this prayer, pray this in the quietness of your heart and say amen at the end and God will hear and answer. So let's pray. Father God, thank you that Jesus came to save me from my sins. I'm sorry for rejecting you in my life. Please forgive me. Thank you that Jesus died for my sins so that I can be forgiven. Help me now to follow Jesus as my Saviour and King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.